In a way, humans are conditioned the same way we train animals. Here's a cookie for behaving. Here's a spanking for talking back. Here's a gold star for raising your hand in class. Francis Fome has written a book called Can You Hear Me? to take ownership of traditions and behaviors that no longer serve us. Fome is the poster woman for breaking cultural norms. She owns a trucking dispatch company, is a partner in a logistics brokerage firm, and she has a closing line for female truckers. Please, thank you for being here, Francis. <laughs> thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> so why the trucking industry? Oh, that, that fell in my lap, actually. <laughs> it started because I actually worked next door <laughs> for a signage company. And I was there for almost uh, three years, but I've been in the signage industry for almost 17 years. And so I had reached a plateau in the signage industry and I wanted to embark on a new endeavor. And so my son, my sister and I, we were all talking on how we could build generational wealth and trucking came up and then real estate came up. And then my son was like, well, mom, I'm going to go this way. So me and my sister were like, hmm, what do we do? Because he's the one that had most of the capital at the time. So my sister and I were like, what are we going to do? What can we do? What's the least thing that we can enter into that's the least barrier to entry? And then she was like, well, sis, right now I'm in trucking school. What? You are? She's like, yeah. I said, okay, I'll be done in two months. And I'm like, shoot, let's do it. And then she was like, why don't we try dispatching? Dispatching? What the hell is that? <laughs> She's like, well, you know, I took this course and this is how it goes. Like, really? Yeah, it's really simple, sis. And I was like, all right, here, give me the login and let me figure out how to do this thing. So. That's what we did. We met each other and we scheduled a time frame. We met every morning for about like three months talking about our LLC, about how we're going to structure the company and then our mission statement and things like that. And in the interlude, the clothing line came about because, because of my background in signage, I know Adobe Illustrator. So I'm looking at all these trucking sites and I don't see any cool gear for women on here. This is something for them. She was like, well, then do it. So then Class A Chicks came about. <laughs> While I was still working at that place and transitioning so that way we could do dispatching full on, my sister decided that she didn't want to participate anymore. So... I was doing dispatching and signage at the same time, trying to <laughs> book these carriers, onboard them, and then um, do that at the same time. I guess the amount of work that was coming in from it was a bit too difficult for her to multitask. But for me, that was something that I did every day. I imagine it wasn't as easy as it sounds. I imagine you got a lot of pushback and... Let's face it, discrimination. <laughs> For me, I'm really a good people person. So that kind of thing, that really doesn't phase me. I think maybe it came from my sales background too. And we know that women makes up 10% of the drivers in the trucking industry. So what barriers do you still see that might prevent that number from growing? I don't really think it's a barrier to entry. I think it's okay. really, hurt. for me, I think it's really more women asserting themselves and not really taking any shit. Like, I think it's really connecting with people in a way where they you feel that they're important and they know that you care about what they're doing and how important it is to their livelihood. And that's how I was able to connect to, with the drivers and the ship companies that I have worked with. I wonder if there's a big a bit of a misperception in that for women as well. Most of the women that I have seen who are in the trucking industry, who are long haulers, they're pretty tiny. <laughs> <laughs> they're not, 
they're not big beefy guys or bodybuilders or anything. So there is there a uh, misunderstanding about the physical aspects? I'm sure there are physical aspects to that job, but is that one of the barriers that you think? Or one of the things think... that might keep them from? No, I don't think that's a barrier to entry at all. I mean, because they have to go around the trucks. So specifically, I think you're referring more to the truck drivers. As okay. far as the women drivers, there's really no difference in you're just driving the truck. It's really more the skill set of what you have. If you yeah. have a great trainer or if you had a great trainer and they've taught you, backing up is a lot what I've heard from the truckers because one of my partners, he used to be a trucker. And so that's really one of the main issues is really backing up. And it doesn't matter if you're a female or a male, because what I've heard is, is that the women drivers are more precise than men are. Did your family, other than your sister and your kids, think you were nuts <laughs> to join this profession? <laughs> uh, so going to my family relationship, <gasps> I don't like really have that dynamic. They know that if I'm going to do something, get out of my way. Cause I'm about to like tear some shit up. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. So what are some of those cultural norms that you grew up with? The traditional things men are to be quiet, do what their husbands tell them to do, not speak up. And opinionation or being opinionated, definitely out of the question. You know, the cooking thing, making sure that all the kids are being taken care of. And then while you work a full-time job, make sure the whole house is clean, that kind of stuff. Did you have any thoughts of what you wanted to be as a kid, what you wanted to be when you were older? I did. I knew I didn't want to be broke. <laughs> so... Yeah. That's one thing. And then I knew I didn't want to step into the same realm of traditionalism and the cultural norm. I really despised the environment that I grew up in. And because of that, that steered me into a direction of where I wanted to be and where I am now. So how would you describe cultural conditioning? So cultural conditioning, like you mentioned earlier, it, you're teaching the dog. If the dog is being good, you give them a treat, and then the dog will continue in that particular behavior. Or if the kid, you tell them to be quiet, and if they're quiet, you give them a cookie, they're going to know that when they're quiet, more cookies are coming. So it's very much like that. It's a behavior that is cyclical. I think when it comes from a cultural setting, that people won't look at you in a different light. But when you do, when you do act out of, I guess, the norm of culture, that's when people are giving you the side eye or they're looking at you like, what's she doing? It's strange. Why is she talking like that? Why is she behaving outside of what we consider standard or normal? We still see that with <laughs> treatment against women. Why aren't you married? Why do you have kids? You know, all the other aspects. I am not a fan of that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any role models when you were younger and who was your inspiration? Role models. I grew up in church a lot. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say that there's a family that I grew up with and I call them Pops. I would look at him as a father figure because when I grew up, I didn't have a male that was there that actually listened to me. And I felt that Pops gave me that platform to actually be heard. He is what I would look for as far as like any advice, but he's no longer with us. What has taught you the most about being a female in a non-traditional role? I think that was really more experience because the signage industry is fully male. That also assisted me in how to behave and deal with and communicate with my male counterparts. 
sometimes it's easier too isn't it because you learn you learn the ropes you learn how to how do you describe it toughen up <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah I, but I also grew up in a house like where they were all boys mm. and then my stepdad and I was the only girl and so my stepdad treated me like a boy I already had that like rough boy mentality it was like you mess with me <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would help I could see why that would help you in, in your career <laughs> Do you think there will ever be a day when we don't have to use the word non-traditional? Mm. I think when we put labels on things, we confine ourselves to what that is. So just because this group over here, group A, is using non-traditional, you can have that. I'm going to use, I'm a woman in the signage industry. And if you don't like it, you're not paying my bills. Not that I don't honor your opinion, but I honor my own self to make sure that I do what I need to do so that I could feed my family and the things that I love to do in and around me. It's, there's probably not a lot of women in your field. Who do you go to for advice? For advice, I usually, so we have installers that are on those kind of projects. Oh, wait, for this field that I'm in or in the old field? Either one. Oh, usually the truck drivers themselves, because they're in the field talking to the clients, making sure things are unloaded and loaded on the vehicle or if they run into anything. Those guys are the ones, they're hands on. So they would be the best point of contact. And then people that have been in the industry for a long time. So mm -hmm. I have a cousin that has been in the industry for 30 years. I reach out to him. And then my partner, he's been in the industry for 30 years as well. So both of them used to be truck drivers. Now let's get on to your book. What made you decide to write it? Well, my daughter. <laughs> We had one of those experiences. You've seen like maybe videos around or, you know, interactions with people and, you know, they're tussling with their kids. This tussle came out of that. This book <laughs> came out of that, one of those tussles. I think we were arguing one day and she was like, you don't listen. I was like, taken back because none of my kids, I have three of them. None of them ever talked back to me, but this one, this particular one. <laughs> I wonder where she got that from. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, point, point, I know all your buttons. And it just so happened that same week at work, my colleague was like, dude, you got a problem. And then one of my best friends, she was like, you, something's wrong with you. You got a problem. So like all three of those things happened the same week. And I was like, something's wrong with me. So I had to start from there. I started to take a deep dive into what the issues were within me that created this kind of response. And I imagine a lot of it stems back to your cultural upbringing. Absolutely. I didn't realize how much though. Yeah. I just thought, oh, these are my responses. But no, like we break it down and like, my mom used to say that, or my dad used to say that. It's so yeah. funny. <laughs> and then you become mortified. <laughs> oh my gosh. I said that in one of my chapters for the new book that I'm writing, that my therapist, she had this way of like turning things around and saying, hey, Francis, did you notice something between this event here and what you said that your mom did? And I was like, Oh my God, I turned it to my mom. <laughs> oh. Mortifying. I definitely never saw myself in that light. But, you know, the truth of light. <laughs> yes, it's, it's the circle of life, right? <laughs> what are some of the lessons that you've learned that help break these cultural norms? 
some of the things that I did was in our culture, children, they're taught to be quiet and not to communicate their feelings mm. in any family matter or anything like that. The only thing they're there for is you have them, they're going to do some chores and they're doing their homework, doing what kids do, except the portion of being opinionated and sharing their thoughts about what's going on in the family. So with that, I had to stop and listen to my kids because I had counted their opinion as something that didn't matter, but I didn't realize that they, their energy is in the element of our environment, is, uh, of our family. And I need that in order for us to flow as a unit. And I was only using my own energy. And so I was crushing them. I was crushing their spirit. I was crushing their hearts. I was crushing their voices. And when we do that in the home, they also take that outside and they behave in that same manner when they're out in the world. And they don't need to be like that. They need to be open and free and allowed to spread their wings. But I had compressed them into this little thing. And, oh, that really hurt me. And I know it hurt them too. It's interesting to hear you say that about your daughters too, because that is part of the boy code that is cultural in North America anyway. We teach boys that you are not to show emotion. You are not to say not to speak up or anything, but not to show emotion. See that as almost a cultural, it's every culture almost. <laughs> you're absolutely right. I've seen it like a lot in minority cultures, but yeah, you're right. It, the boy code, it's everywhere. And I didn't even realize that until you mentioned it. Crying is considered weakness, which is the same thing in the boy code. Dr. William Pollack wrote a fascinating book years ago that basically dumbed it down that anyone can understand it. It taught me to understand more what a lot of boys and men go through. Mm -hmm. So what's your advice to your daughters and other young girls who are challenged and who to be who they are and break th free of these misogynistic rules they are taught in their cultures? I would say in, that they should be true to themselves. Whatever it is that they really want to do, whatever that goal is, go after it and don't allow anyone to stop you from pursuing it. Because you have that goal or Whatever that thing is inside of you that's driving you, you have it there for a reason. It's meant for you to fulfill. It doesn't matter what the world labels it as. It can be non-traditional. It can be traditional. All that I know is that I had a desire to fulfill something and not stay there. I had to get out of what was created around me in order for me to be where I am today. And so that could mean that I'll be hurting people's feelings. That could mean that your friends won't be looking at you the same, or you even might lose some friends and people that you love. But at the end of the day, the happiness, it sits within and inside of you. And that's something that you cannot trick. That's something that you can't lie to because that thing will always be sitting there every single day asking you to open up that space of happiness and fulfill that desire that's burning deep within you. Wow. And you mentioned you're working on another book? I am. Yeah, it's called The Victim and Violator. Oh, wow. Tell me more. Yeah, it's like a prelude to the book that I just released, the first one that I released a few months ago. And it just talks about the conditioning of how I got to where I was at through my culture, through just traditional thinking, and then how I unyielded myself out of there to be this version that I am today. And what else is next? Do you have any other clothing lines or <laughs> businesses that you're going to be opening? <laughs> right now I'm working on expanding our freight brokerage into, because like we're already on the West Coast. So now we're trying the Midwest and the East Coast. That's what I'm putting my energy into right now is 
because I'm a part of the sales team. So expansion and development is on the horizons for our brokerage. And then as far as the clothing line, oh yeah, I do actually. My son's clothing line, it's called Somebody First. <laughs> so I'm working on that clothing line that should be coming out in January. 